Hello, this is the longer version of the movie recommender project presentation. This presentation will go into more detail than the previous presentation. So the previous presentation just go over this website, which is the final outcome of the project. But this presentation will go over the whole project uh, from the very beginning. So this project is mostly Python. I try to do things using Python whenever possible in this project. And you will need NumPy and SciPy installed. Python's not that good at multi-threading. So for the ALS model computation, I need to use C++. Python is not used on the web browser. The web browsers, uh, the web browser programs are written in JavaScript, so that's why JavaScript is part of the project. The movie recommendation engines, they're using the, I'm using the movie lens data set. So movie lens data set is at grouplens.org. And it's basically a data set of a lot of ratings. Actually, it's 27 million ratings. Uh, so there are several data sets here. I'm using, to test out my ideas, the very first part of the project is done using the 100K data set. And after that, I went on to the, use the full data set, which is 26, excuse me, which is 27 million ratings by uh, 280,000 users. So that's the data set. Uh, I'll go over the hardware requirements. So if you're running this on PC, uh, you need 16 gigabyte of memory if you're using quad core. Now, if you don't have enough memory, I have a flag in my scripts. I have a flag like CPU count. You can reduce the, the number of threads, the number of processes that the Python scripts are using so, to, so that you can get by with lower memory. The task with the highest memory usage is the build similar movies database. Okay, that's the step that's actually built the similar movie. So when you type in like Star Trek, and when you click similar movies, it's not computing those movies in real time. It, it's it's loading pre-computed movies. This, these movies are all pre-computed. So that's what this step is building similar movies uh, database. This is the most um, resource intensive step. It's, it requires three gigabytes of memory per process. I would also like to add that as time goes on, the data set will get larger. So as time goes on, you're gonna need more than 16 gigabyte of memory. Uh, the AWS is optional in this project. Everything w can be done on Windows, but cloud computing is very important in data science and machine learning. So that's why it's included as part of the project. I'm using just the basic AWS services. S3 is the storage service. It's very low cost. DynamoDB is more like a lookup table it's not a real it's not a real database it's more like a lookup table and because it's very simple it's very low cost and it can scale very well so basically that this site can handle a large amount of traffic because it's using DynamoDB EFS is a cluster based file system it's for cluster computing it's kind of like Hadoop HDFS so it's used for it's used to share data between multiple computers. EFS is much more expensive than S3. So the idea is like to store the stuff long term in S3, move to EFS to do processing, and then move back to S3 when you're done. Uh, I'm using AEC2. That's Amazon's uh, compute service. So Amazon EC2 has some very powerful instances. They have computers that are 96 cores.
they have computers that have like a terabyte of memory. So, so just in comparison, right? My computer is just a quad core and my computer has uh, 16 gig of memory. So it's over here. <laughs> so quad core and 16 gigabytes of memory. So for very uh, ex uh, compute intensive task, it's better to do it on Amazon EC2. Lambda is like uh, Amazon's managed server service. So this website, when I click search, there's a software running on Amazon servers that handles the search result. And I am not running the server. The Amazon is running the server. I'm, I'm just telling Amazon to run a search function. So that's what Lambda is. It's like, it's a serverless computing. So I don't have to run the server. Web hosting, this is also done using AWS. Amazon's web hosting infrastructure is uh, very advanced. The key is that Amazon has a lot of computers all over the world. So when you use this methodology to write your website, when you use Amazon's CloudFront in conjunction with Amazon Lambda, Amazon's running those servers on locations all over the world. So the website will be fast. Uh, all over the world. If you run your own server in, say, in the US West, people in India or Japan will have very slow website response because they because the server is far away from them. But if you, you know, uh, run your website on Amazon's CloudFront and Amazon Lambda, uh, people everywhere will have fast access to the website. The recommendation models in this project uses the linear model. So here I'll review what a linear model is. A linear model is a dot product, like between a user factor and an item factor. So here's an example. The user, this user likes science fiction a lot more than romance. So the user's uh, science fiction rating is much higher than romance. And here are two movies. So one movie is mostly science fiction, the other movie is mo mostly classified as romance. And so if you use a linear model, Lewis dot Star Trek will give a much higher score than Lewis dot Titanic. So this is modeling. Given parameters, you come up with the score, a rating. Machine learning is the opposite of modeling. It's, it's the reverse of modeling. And in machine learning, you're given the, the rating and you have to come up with these parameters. The green stuff, the green parameters, they're actually labels in the data. So in the database, in the data set, uh, they have labels in it already, like, like this movie Heat is labeled as action, crime, and thriller. And there's also, there's a tax the, the data set, the movie lens data set has a tags.csv file, and that also has more of these attributes that can be used during the modeling process. So the green stuff <clears throat> comes from the data set, and the blue stuff, the blue numbers, the user factors, they come from the least square process. Now the problem with uh, linear modeling as presented in the previous slide is that these factors, they come from a data set. So that means that you have to have people labeling the data set. You have to have someone label heat as action, crime, and thriller. You have to have people you know, tagging this movie as a twist ending. So you have to have people looking at data set and putting labels on it, and that can be expensive. ALS is an alternative way to label it when it's an alternative way to model things when the labels don't really have a particular meaning. The labels are derived mathematically. So this is how the ALS 
model looks like. So user factor, which is unknown, u0 and u0, 1 dot product with the movie factors. So Star Trek has two factors. And again, I, I don't know what they are. I'll just call them m0, 0, m0, 1. So and and this is the rating that this is like a center rating. Ratings are from one to five stars. So the center of the rating would be like zero. And so plus 2.5 would mean like a positive 2.5. This would correspond to a five star rating. That's what I'm trying to say. So in ALS, the equation that we're trying to solve for is this. Each movie is like by each user. So Lewis rated Star Trek 2.5 stars, adjusted, centered. And this represents one equation. And Lewis rated Titanic 0.5 stars. And this represents another equation. And the M's and the U's are unknown. So the ALS solution is to randomize one of these two unknowns and then solve for the other one. So in this case, uh, randomize M, so 2.3, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. These are just random numbers, OK? Random numbers for M solve for U. And you can do that because there's two equations and there's two two unknowns. The two, uh, the two unknowns are U. 0 comma 0 and u 0 comma 1. So randomize m solve for u that gives you u this. Now you reverse it and then you 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 use the u here. So u 2 to 22.73 it's over here 22.73. The u uh, minus 8.65 is over here my say 0.65. Now you solve for m. Now in this case, this actually cannot be done because I don't have enough equations. You have four unknowns. You have m00, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So there are four unknowns for m. So I need like four equations for a stable solution, at least four equations. So so this that's why the example stops here. But you see that if I have enough ratings, if I have like 27 million ratings, like I have in the full data set, I can actually solve for the M's. And once I solve for the M's, I, you know, I fix the M's, I solve for the U's, and I just keep repeating this process of solving for M's and U's, and eventually it will stabilize to something. And so that's how ALS finds a solution for the M's and the U's. One of the main challenge of solving the ALS model system is the sheer size of the matrix. Each equation in an ALS setup is a user movie rating data point. So for example, Lewis dot Star Trek 2.5 stars results in a single equation. As of 2018 September, the movie lens data has 27 million ratings. So the system of, of equations, the AX equal B matrix, this matrix is 27 million rows tall. This matrix is 280,000 times 11 uh, columns wide. Uh, because this comes from 280,000 users and each user given 11 factors. So in the previous example, it's, it's just like this. But the difference is that I have two factors. I have uh, u0, zero, comma, 0, and u0, zero, comma, 1, just two factors here. So in the real one, I'm using 11 factors. So this equation, it looks the same, but it has 11 u's. So this matrix is very tall and it's very wide, but it's mostly zeros because each line, as you have seen in the previous slide, is each line is a simple equation. To solve ALS in Python, uh, I look for 
ways to solve a sparse matrix. So the Python, the SciPy package has two algorithms for sparse matrices, uh, the LSMR and the LSQR algorithm. So this program demonstrates how to use the LSQR and the LSMR algorithms. So you run the program and the program generates a matrix and then you know like ax equals b right so it generates a matrix it also generates b and well and then it, it it uses that to solve for it now after solving for it i compare the x uh x real is the the x that i used to generate the data x ls mr is the the x vector that's produced by the function call. So basically this program, the script, shows how to use this function call and it checks to be sure that the, the result, the resulting x, the ax equal b, that x is correct. It, it's similar to the real thing. And also try the lsqr. So remember, like I said, there are two algorithms in the scipy package for sparse matrix. Uh, systems, the LSMR and LSQR, the, the LSMR seems to be always faster, it has a shorter running time, and that's probably because it's using fewer iterations to arrive at the final result. So that's using the, the, the Python's uh, SciPy's LSMR algorithm to solve large sparse matrices uh, quickly. And another program is to show that the ALS solution procedure, this, this alternating ALS stands for alternating least squares, that I'm alternating between the, the use, the user factor, which I call the use, and the M's, the movie factors. So I'm, this procedure actually works. So that's the purpose of, that's the purpose of the ALS.py program. So run the ALS.py program like this, Python ALS.py. And I'm iterating it and uh, as I'm iterating it, the, the, the losses get better and better. So like before I generate the data. So I, well, first I generate user and movie, uh, just random number generator, generate these vectors. And then I use the dot products to generate a whole bunch of data. I split the data into training and test sets. I use the ALS procedure on the training data, and then I, you know, check the model by using the test data. And so this script, the purpose of this script is to show that the procedure that I mentioned here actually does work. And it seems to work really well too. Uh, the loss using the test data is like virtually no loss. Now the thing to realize that, like before, I, I compare between users. Users is the the u vector that's produced by my algorithm, and users real, that's the the original users vector. So I. I So I have a user vector to generate the data. That's the user real. That's the the real user vector to, to generate all this data. And this is the users is from my ALS algorithm. The point I'm trying to make is that the ALS will produce a user's vector that's quite different from the user real vector. A movie vector that's also quite different from the movie real vector. But they still produce uh, a very good result, okay? Because this problem is, it's basically non-convex. There are multiple minimums to this optimization problem. That's what I'm trying to say. So that's the purpose of this script is to prove that the ALS, uh, the, the, I might have the right procedure to solve the ALS uh, problem.
in any kind of machine learning system, machine learning application, you need a metric. You need a metric to tell you how good your models, how good your algorithms are. And rating using the rating score from the user is not a good metric. Uh, the reasons are given here. The rating from the user is a categorical data. So the scores are approximate in the sense that if a user gives two movies, if the user rate two movies four stars, that doesn't mean that the two movies are exactly equally good. It only means that they're, those two movies are approximately equally good. Okay. And second reason is that the purpose of a rec recommendation system is to produce a set of rankings. So the, and the user sees the rankings only. The user doesn't see the scores of the recommendation engine. The user doesn't care about the scores of the recommendation engine. The user only sees the rankings. So the metric should be based on how good that ranking is. It shouldn't be based on how close the scores are to the user scores. And finally, there are recommendation algorithms. There are recommendation algorithms that don't produce scores so for example, there are similarity algorithms. Some recommendation algorithms look at similarity between movies and then use that similarity to make recommendations. And there's, and those algorithms don't produce scores. And so you can't just use, you know, you can't evaluate them based on the scores because they don't produce scores. So the rank agreement percentage is a metric that I made up to uh, evaluate the effectiveness of the algorithms that I'm using in this project. So this is the documentation file for the project. Uh, under the section 100k data set, there's a section called agreement percentage. And this section explains what this agreement percentage metric is. So I have an example. Uh, suppose that the user rated the movies uh, B, C, A, B, C, five stars, and the user rated movies uh, D, E, F, four stars. So this is a test set, a test set, okay? Now this test set is implying the following nine constraints, the following nine requirements that A is higher than D, A is ranked higher than E, A is ranked higher than F, and so on. And B is higher than the other three movies, and C, C is higher than D, E, F. So this test set from the user is implying nine requirements. And suppose the model, the, the algorithms that I have, uh, creates, created this prediction. The A and B are, are in the five star category and the CDEF is in the four star category. Now this prediction result satisfies six out of nine requirements. Okay, so A is higher than you know, DEF, B is higher than DEF. But C is in the same category as DEF, so the requirement here that C is higher than DEF, uh, this one is violated in, in the prediction. So we say that the rank agreement is 6 out of 9. 6 out of 9 requirements are satisfied. So the rank agreement is 66%. Uh, The rank agreement metric is something that's that will vary from zero to hundred percent, and this is a top-heavy metric, which is good. Now, top-heavy metric mean uh, when I say top-heavy metric, I mean that the the ranking near the top, like the BNF, matters more than the CD uh, EF. So here's an example. So if the test data set looks like this, if the test set uh, two, mov two movies at the five star, two movies in the four stars, and two movies in the three stars. The A movie has four requirements, A, A bigger than C, D, E, and F. So, so A movie has four requirements, while the C movie has only two requirements. C is you know, bigger than E and F. So, so having the A position correctly is more important than positioning C correctly. So that's why I call it top heavy. It means that getting the top part of the ranking correct is more important than getting the bottom part correct. And that's actually what we want in this kind of application. 
because users see the rankings. Actually, they see the top of the rankings. They don't actually see the bottom of the rankings. So getting the top part of the rankings correct is more important than getting the bottom part ranking correct. So that's another uh, favorable attribute of this metric that I came up with. So now I'll talk about the 100K data project. The goal of this project is to figure out what algorithms to use, how to work with the movie lens data set. And this is done using the 100K data set. So it's done using the small data set to make things easy, uh, to make it easy for me to experiment. And the first four scripts, they are the predictors. They are algorithms to predict the score of a of user rating and then that's being used as a recommender. This one, the movie, the median predictor is the simplest one. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about it. This is just re uh, predicting the movie score by just reporting the movie's median score. So, but it's a good starting point because that's the simplest file. These three files, the count tags, LS tags, and ALS, ratings underscore ALS, uh, these are actual algorithms and they follow the same pattern. So I'll just, <clears throat> they, the, the code follows the same pattern. So first there's the CSV data. This class is the data that's extracted from the CSV files without much processing, okay? And then there's model data, so so the so the model data takes in the CSV data. So the model data does some processing. So genre IDs become genre count and and so on. So movie medians, right? So this is where the movie median is uh, computed in in this class. And then user profile. User profile will take CSV data and model data. So, so this one, user profile takes the, the previous two. And this, this one is even more sophisticated. This is the algorithm itself, basically. So in the tag, in the count tags pi file, this is the algorithm for this file, the building a user file, building a user profile. And tester is, so the user profile can predict, has a prediction function. It can predict, so you give it a, the movie median, you give it some information about the movie and this, this thing can predict. So the tester is using the user profile to make predictions. Okay, so the, whole, the purpose of this whole file is to train models and then make predictions and then compute that that rank agreement percentage that I talked about is to compute this rank agreement percentage using the tag count algorithm. So I'll just run one just to see, just, just to show what it is. Uh, it's in the 100K data and I think it's So the data set has like 600 users. This is a small data set, 100K data set. And for each user, there's a bunch of ratings. And the code early on will split the data set. I think here. We'll split the user ratings into a training set and a testing set. And the training set is being used to create a user profile. This happens for each user. So each user builds up a user profile based on the training set. And then that profile's predict function is used to evaluate that, uh, evaluate model by, by making predictions on, and then the predictions are being compared against the test set. And the comparison it's not done just simply comparing scores. 
because I, I said that's not a good idea. Simply comparing scores is not a, simply comparing the model's predicted score to the actual user score is not a good idea. Uh, instead, it's a rank agreement. So the outcome of the script is a rank agreement. So this algorithm count, counting tags produce an out rank agreement 64% and there's actually a chart. So a lot of people are 60-ish percent and some people have a near perfect rank agreement. So that, and this is basically done for every single, uh, this is what all those different algorithms do. I mean, this is basically what these four Python files do that for each algorithm, I'm computing the rank agreement and then I'm printing out that bar chart that you, you I just that you just saw. So I'll go over the <clears throat> oh, I'll go over the pattern again. So they all follow the same pattern and I want to make the code independent, so so these this code can be modified independently. And there's a lot of copy and pasting. So for example, the CSV data, you're going to see it over here as well. Again, CSV data, model data, that's the same thing, I think. CSV data, model data, with some differences probably, but mostly the same thing. And then this one, the third class, this is one where it becomes unique. Like ALS has the ALS model, that's different. And user profile, this user profile is different from the user profile here because it's a different algorithm. So that's the basic pattern. There's a class for CSV data. There's some additional processing called model data. And then there's a totally unique algorithm uh, specific class. And there's a tester class that's kind of similar because they do the same thing. They, you basically go through each user and then you use the predict function here and then you see how well the predictions align with the actual test data. So that's the pattern of uh, of these four scripts grouped at the top. And next I'll talk about how the algorithms work. I'm not going to talk about median predictor, that's just reporting the medians. Uh, first I'll talk about the count tags algorithm. So here's the documentation file again uh, under 100k dataset count tag counting. That's the first algorithm. So here's an example: a user rates a science fiction movie four stars. So this translates into a plus one for science fiction, right? Because three three is three stars is the neutral rating, so four stars translates into a plus one score. So if the user writes the science fiction movie five stars, okay, that user gets a plus two to the to the science fiction tag. And I'm building up a user profile by by collecting all these these uh, plus ones and plus twos. It's, so that's why it's called tag counting. I'm 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 counting all those instances where the you the user is rating a movie positively or negatively. So the result of tag counting is something like this, you know, uh, or there's also scaling. Okay. So depending how popular a movie is, is I have to scale it anyways, uh, at the end of the, the outcome of the tag counting is, is to build some kind of profile. So there's genre profile cause science, science fiction is a genre. So this would be something like me, right? Uh, someone who likes science fiction, but don't like thrillers. So this is someone who's been rating science fiction movies positively and rating thriller movies uh, negatively. So these are accumulated and scaled, you know, values. And separate from the genre profile, there's also tag profile. So uh, this is separate because in the data set, these are separate data, uh, data tables. So just as a review, uh, the movie lens data table has a file called tags.csv like like this and it has all the tags 
and then separately there's a genre there's actually there's a movie CSV and this movie has all the genres and these are two systems I, I cannot mix them together because they they're they're in different they're done differently like this one every movie has a genre and it's done globally while the tax is, is done by individuals and not every movie has a Leonardo DiCaprio tag for example so so in this code I'm keeping these two sets of information separate that's what I'm trying to say here and those two sep these two sets of informations combined uh, linearly there's equation computation just read the documentation for more information and oh uh, I can show you the, the actual one because I have the project already completed completed so here's the ratings that I did these I didn't rate that many movies okay that's so but there's a lot of tags that's why I want to point out so that, so this is the tag count using the tag counting uh, so the tag profile now of course in the documentation here I, I kind of grow grossly simplify things okay this person doesn't like violence okay but in reality even though I did not review that many movies there were a lot of tags there were hundreds of tags and I'm I'm only keeping the top 100 I'm keeping just the top 100 tags so based on the the movies that I reviewed, there and there weren't that many of them. I already have a lot of tags. So Joe Russo and Anthony Russo. That's because I reviewed the Marvel movies positively and they are the directors and people they're the people who worked on the movies. So so give them high score and so on. There are a lot of tags. And relatively not that many uh genres, so that's why. I have to keep them separate. Now notice that this model captures all the information. All the all the text is in the model. I, I'm just not printing them out. I'm just printing out the top 100, but actually this this approach tracks all of the tags. That's what I'm trying to say. And there are two profiles. So for move so not all movies have tags. That's that's what I'm saying. So if the movie has tags, they're this is the model. The tag importance uh, tag becomes more, much more important than genre. And for this is for movies without tags, and you know obviously there's no tag importance factors. It's all about genre and user bias. So these this number this number is the this number is the coefficient. It's over here. This is x zero. Yeah, x zero is is the tag importance. And the x1 factor is the genre importance. So the information is in the documentation. Uh, if you want to follow up on and read more about this, what I'm doing here. But the basic idea is to collect all the tags, you know, give them scores, and then and then use that to predict user rating. So next is a uh, model, the tag LS. LS stands for least squares. So in count tags, I'm I'm using all the tags and I'm I'm kind of counting which one's most popular. But I'm using all of the tags and all of the genres. Uh, least the tag LS, LS excuse me, LS tags. Is taking another another approach where I'm using some of the tags and some of the genres. So, show you the code. Actually, I show you the call tree. That's probably easier. So here's the model. If four factors are used, right? So it looks like this. So and those those factors f zero through f two. They are uh, they vary for each movie. <clears throat> and the coefficients are derived through least squares. Okay, so remember with this one, the tag counting with the tag count algorithm, I'm using 
all of the information. So with the tag ls, I'm just using a few of the information. So go here. So I'm using action genre, I'm using the action genre, adventure genre, sci-fi, I'm using BD videos and franchise. So apparently I really don't like franchise. <laughs> Let's go to, go to call tree. So the key is I have to decide the number of factors. Remember, I'm, I'm not using all of the factors. I have, to, I have to decide on how many factors to use. That's based on how many movies reviews there are, right? Because all the, the, all the coefficients, all these x values are being determined by least squares. So I, I can't have too many variables, right? See what? In the tag counting, I'm adding up all the tags, so that allows me to use all the available information. But here, because I'm determining the coefficients via least squares, I cannot use all of the information. I have to choose, you know, the top genres and the top tags to use. Now, exactly how do I choose that is based on this function, uh, decide new factors and decide profiles. So decide new factors decide how many factors to use and this is based on the movie reviews it's, there's some kind of scheduling there's some kind of uh, a table like this right if I have 10 equations I can only use five factors right the number of factors must be fewer than the number of equations and the gap grows wider and wider because when you start using tags um, the movies a lot of movies don't have the tags so it ended up being like a kind of like a sparse matrix so that's that's how it is. I have to decide how many ta factors to use. I have to decide what factors to use. Then I, I compile. Then I uh, compute the factors. Compute the x factors. So I have to decide what f factors to use. That's what I meant. I have to decide the f factors, the factor variables. They vary from for each movie and for each user. <laughs> then I compute the, the coefficients. So this approach, and it's, it's the code does similar things. It will print out the agreement percentage on average, and it has it will print out that bar chart. So is it ls tags or okay? Or it's tag ls. And I kind of want to point out, this is, this is a good time to point out that this one's kind of more obvious, that there tends to be a peak at, at the very end. This is like 100% agreement, okay, at, at the very high end. There, yeah, it, there's a tendency to do that, and now it's a good time to point out why. The metric that I'm, that I'm using tends to do that, the metric itself. So. The metric will vary from 0% to 100%. However, if I put a C over here, then it will match the test set exactly, and it will be 100%. But if I move it down here, the, the rating drops to 60, 66%. So this, so in a sense, this metric is kind of unstable, that it's either 100% or 66%. It, it, it's hard to get something in between that especially for people who don't have that many reviews like it's hard to get something that's 95 percent actually okay the reason that you in the bar chart you saw people with 95 percent is because this is not a typical data set um let me bring let me bring up the point here Uh, the the data set the small data set is not simply a random sample of of the large data set. So the hundred k data set, not this one. Okay, so over here, hundred k data set. So it only has six hundred users. And that's 100K. So 
So on average, that's a lot of users. So let me see how many, right? 100K over 600. So on average, that's like 166, 167 reviews per user. Now, if you look at the full data set, so the, my point is that there's a lot of reviews per user. So it's 26 million, 27 million and 280,000 users. So that's million and Like 280,000 actually. So that's significantly fewer reviews per user on average. And so, so for people, and so for people with low number of reviews, you're going to get that situation where that I'm trying to show here that, that you either get a hundred percent or you get like 66%. There's just, there's just no in between. So, and it's not that obvious here because of the, this data set, it's, you know, these people have a lot of reviews, but, but if this algorithm, this metric is applied on the full data set, this, there's a much higher peak at the very end because of this phenomenon. So that's the, that's the LS tag. So I briefly went over how roughly how that works and I'll go over uh, the ALS algorithm. I'll show you the equation. Yeah, the equation looks like this, similar to what I shown, but there's a you have to offset the data. Uh, this kind of equation, the, this part in the middle, oops. This part in the middle only works really only if the data, it works really well if the data is centered. So first I'm getting movie median and I have a user bias to to further center the data. Because the median by itself doesn't, does not center the data. And what else I have to show? Oh, oh I, I need to shrink the data, yeah. Yeah, so the least square procedure is stable only if, you know, there's sufficient number of equations. The number of equations has to be larger than the number of variables. So if the ALS is using three factor variables and four factor variables for movies, okay, okay. Okay, this part, three for movies, four for user because of the bias factor, right? So the movies M0, M1, M2 factors uh, the user u0, u1, u2, but user has to have a user bias to to help center data. The least square does not work well if the data is not centered. So for a model with three factors in form, the movie, this movie can be included if it has, has only viewed at least three times. This is to satisfy this requirement that I have sufficient number of equations to, to guarantee a reasonable solution. And the user can only be included if he has made four reviews. Okay, so let's let me go back to the data set for the hundred K data set. Okay. Six hundred users, you know, hundred thousand ratings. Okay, okay. So almost all the users are included because just about everybody has made, you know, sufficient number of uh, reviews, right? The limiting factor here is the movies. There are 9,000 movies and only 600 users. So a lot of movies are only reviewed by one or two users. So when the ALS, in order for the ALS algorithm to be applied, a lot of those movies are dropped out because they don't satisfy the linear uh, equation requirement. They don't, they don't have enough equations associated with those movies. A solution for those movies would be unreliable. So anyway, there's a function called shrink data set and it shrinks the data set. I don't print out the, hmm, let me get rid of this one. So I don't print out the number of movies that got dropped, but 
in the full version. So this is this code is the 100k data in the full version of the code. I will print out how many movies got accepted. You know how many users got accepted. But for the 100k data, I don't print that out. Basically, virtually all of the users are accepted into ALS. But a lot of these movies are dropped because they don't have enough uh, ratings associated with them. In the real data set, I will drop both users and movies because uh, the real data set has a lot fewer reviews uh, per user. So there are so when I drop IDs, I have to remap those IDs. So here's an example. The IDs need to form a continuous vector. So user ID zero, all the user factors, they, they combine into a single vector, like the X vector. This X vector, so user zero is located at X zero through X two. So assuming three factors per user, okay? And user one is located X three through X five. Now. The point here is that you can't have holes in, in between. So if I drop a certain user, I create if I drop user two, right? And then there's a hole in there. Yeah, so I have to remap them so that the users form a continuous vector. That that's what this remapping ID means. And so there's lookup tables in, in the code like the movie ID from the data set. Okay, that means uh, this movie ID, right? Suppose, like I said, like there's 9,000 movies, right? But a lot of them got dropped, so, so I think it's continuous here, maybe not. But after I drop a bunch of them, the IDs are no longer continuous, so there's a dictionary for looking stuff up. Okay, right there. There's a dictionary that maps from the data sets movie ID to the ALS movie ID. Similarly, there's data set user ID to the ALS user ID. So, so that's a point that I'm trying to make is that I have to, after dropping people, I have to remap the IDs. And there's, in the code, there's a dictionary structure for looking up the IDs. And let me run this. Ratings. So as a review, the ALS solution kind of alternates between, okay, so here's the bar. So, okay, okay, so like I said, you know, some models produce a very high, uh, they tend to produce all or nothing. So there's a bunch of people with perfect match and then, yeah, it's much harder to create people with low well, in this case, a lot of the movies got dropped. Okay, so there's it's like there's fewer ratings. When the movies got dropped, the data associated with those movies can no longer be used in the training set or the test set. It's you don't see this in the in the previous two models. You don't see that in the previous two models because they don't drop anything. The ALS model dropped a whole bunch of movies because because that linear system requirement. And then, because they drop so many, it, it tends to have this all or nothing effect. You know, when the number rating is small, you, you tend to have either perfect score or 66% score. You know, just if you move this here, it's perfect score. So that's why the tail and it's so obvious here. Now back to the code I was trying to make. So like before, it prints out the average agreement, rank agreement. But what I want to point out is this is the ALS procedure. And the ALS procedure is iterating between two variables. So first it holds, say, movie factors constant and solve for the user factors. And then it holds the movie, it holds the user factors constant and solve for movie factors. So it's kind of iterating between the two. 
and you see the losses are dropping but the losses are dropping slower and slower so the termination for ALS is when the losses are no longer dropping sufficiently so I think I have set a criteria of 1% if I'm not getting 1% improvement it's time to stop iterating and call that the solution where I have so that's me trying to explain the the stopping condition for the ALS the median it's, it's here because of it's a baseline algorithm. So in any machine learning situation, we need some simple algorithms that act as the baseline. So it, all this effort spent on doing this ALS or tag counting, is that justified? I mean, does that outperform the baseline algorithm? That's what I'm trying to say. So there's actually two baseline algorithms. They, they're using the same code. Uh, there's the median and there's the average. So, uh, and the results are in over here, 100K data set results. So the median comes down at the very bottom. So, okay, notice that there's a range. The range happens because I'm using the, the training set is being randomly selected at each, uh, each time you run the script. Each time you run the script, the the training set is actually is over here, compute training set. The training set is selected randomly, so that's why there's a range in agreement percentage. Like I said, there are two baseline algorithms, the movie median and the movie average, and median is the worst, and the average is the best. So and that's kind of fits into what we know that just simply recommending movies that are popular, simply re recommending the top movies of say 2018 is a good idea. And it just surprised me how well it is. But of course this is not a valid recommender because it's the same thing for everybody. So that's why, you know, even though it's, it's like really good, you know, I don't, I don't have an option here saying average because that's the same for everybody. You can you can do that yourself if you want to. That's not difficult. Uh, yeah, like I said, there's only one code. There's only one code, the median predictor. So the average is basically, uh, you get the average by modifying this file. Get that. So there's a function called a compute movie median. So all I did is, you know, to use move average instead of medians, uncomment this code and you get to use average. Well, you, you comment out the medians and use this. And you just change the code that instead of using medians, use the average. So that that's that's where that's where this comes from. So these four files are about their recommendation algorithms. These next two are not really recommendation algorithms, but they're used by the application. So similar movies and the title search. So similar movies is the 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 link that shows similar movies like it's this link. So I need that because I want to have this feature. So I want to have a similar movie uh, algorithm. So talk about how, how that's done. So down here, similar movies, this documentation file. Okay, so first I have a similar genre requirement that in order for two movies to be even considered similar, they have to have overlap in genre. Uh, overlap, not exact match, because a lot of movies have multiple genres. So this movie has five genres. So they they have to have an old fifty percent overlap. 
So after if a move if two movies have they pass the genre, you know, this check genre is similar check. They, if they pass that check, if they pass the check, then I try to compute the cosine similarity. So here's an example of computing cosine similarity that I just made up a movie. These two movies are reviewed by different people. The point I want to make is that only the the users who have reviewed both movies are utilized. So four, five, and two, forming a four, five, two here. Uh, this two is not used because user one of three only review one movie, and similarly, this this data point is not used because user user one of four review only the second movie. So this example shows how to compute the cosine similarity. And only the scores they have they come from users that review both movies. Now, and I want to stress that only scores from common users are, are being used, and this is important uh, because cosine similarity has a paradox to it. Uh, basically, cosine similarity just by itself does not work because of, of this paradox. The requirement that uh, the users are are common users okay so what happens that if two movies are actually not that similar okay suppose they're not similar they're not going to have that many common users because they're not that similar because they're not that common they, they don't have that many common users and because we have 27 million ratings in the full data set sometimes the similarity score can be very high just because of uh, uh, just because of coincidence it's because they don't have that many common users. Now think about the opposite situation. If two mu if two movies are actually really similar, and I use the two Star Wars movies here, right? Like Star Wars Episode Five and Star Wars Episode Six, uh, The Empire Strikes Back and The Return of the Jedi. Now these two movies are sequels, right? This is a sequel to that, and people who watch this are gonna watch that. So so they're actually similar movies. But they have a huge number of uh, users in common because people watch one movie, they watch the other one. So in this situation, this, this table, it's like it's, in a full data set, they have like 10,000 columns or something. It's, it's thousands of users in common. So this vector is very, very long. And then it ended up, because there's so many people in common, the similar score is not as high because these people are going to dis they are going to disagree somewhat, right? Because they have a lot of people in common. So you have this paradox where movies that are actually similar don't produce the highest similarity score because they have a lot of people in common. And the solution for that is that you have to compensate for the length of the vector. And it's not simply this. This this down here is not sufficient. Okay, simply just dividing by it's not sufficient. What I'm saying is that you have to boost the the score based on the popularity of the movie, based on how long the the length of the vector. So here's an example. I want to boost it based on, uh, and the boost starts at three, and the boost needs to flatten out. So, okay, if I don't boost the scores at all, then the movies that are not that similar will have a very high similarity score based on just coincidence. Okay, but if I boost uh, Star Wars, you know, if I boost these two movies based on the common users, right, based on having a lot of common users, if I boost them too much, then, then I end up boosting like other popular movies as well. So that the movies that are popular are automatically similar, regardless of what the users actually say. So I, I want to boost them, but I want I don't want to boost them so much, too much. So this is like a logarithmic curve. It grows. It's an LN curve, natural log curve. So it grows slowly over time, and then you, it has to stop after a certain point. So after x limit, it, the maximum boost is um, the buff limit. So this. Part of the documentation talks about the equations and so on. But the idea is that it's a natural log boost curve. It flattens out after a certain number of time. And these numbers are tuned to make those two movies similar, to make these two movies similar. 
Okay, so so in this software, what I did is that these two movies, Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, and The Return of the Jedi, they have 162 uh, reviewers in common. So the buff point is 162. So having more reviewers in common than 162 doesn't give additional boost. And the buff limit is chosen to chosen so that these two movies end up at, at the very top of the similarity search. So I'm gonna run this code. Show the output. And these are the scores. Now notice how the scores are over one because of the boost. And because of this boost, these two movies are at the very top of the of the similarity ranking. So it's like this. Searching for movies similar to 1196, which is Empire Strikes Back. And I got New Hope and also Return of Jedi. Okay. So that so that's the purpose of the boost. So the Star Wars movies are at top because I know they're highly similar. They should be at the top. Now in this example, in this this is the code under 100K data set. In this version of the code, these numbers are manually tuned. But in the next iteration of code, so right now this is the this is a 100k data set iteration. In the next iteration of the code, I improved it so that the tuning is automatic and also had additional filtering. So just skipping ahead a little bit here. Uh, this one. Full data, built similar movies database. So one of the improvements is that automatic tuning, the buff limit and the buff point parameters are were manually tuned back in 100K dataset. And now I have made it automatic. I have added another filter called reliability as a filter. So there's more to the algorithm. It's there's basically there are more improvements to the algorithm later on. That's why I want to say. And so that's that's about similar movies. That's all I want to say about similar movies. At, there's more stuff in the documentation you can read. And I want to talk about the title search. So this is a redirect on Windows. It redirects the output to temp.txt. So first I'll go over why you need that redirect. You need that redirect because the Python can't print out foreign characters and there's foreign characters in the movie titles. So let me just do this. So I'll show you what, what the file I'm talking about. Suppose I have a simple file called test.py here, test.py, and the file is just that, and that will crash. For me, for me, I mean, it might work for some people, but it, it crashes for me, right? Why? Why? Because it, it, they can't print out, uh, they can't print out Chinese characters. However, I want to point out that it it will work. It depends on the environment that you're running in. So, this is Python Council. This is under PyCharms, and this will work. Like you know, so. So that's what I'm trying to say is that you might need this, you might not need this, depending on whether the foreign characters, whether they crash Python or not, I really don't know ahead of time. Plus the data set changes over time anyway. So, okay, so that's, that's why this is there. Uh, title search implements the algorithm for searching. So when I type this in, it you know the stuff comes back out. That's it's a very basic search engine. It's the the term frequency inverse document frequency technique. So this is the TFIDF. And I want to go over the stemmer.
go with that. Right there. Okay, there's there's supporter stammer as you can see. Okay, stemming means uh making words searchable. So let me let me have an example. Say Star War. Now the actual movie is actually called Star Wars, you know, with, with, with the S here, with the capital S. But I left it out and I can still find it because when building the index, the wars with the S got reduced to war. So that's why it makes it searchable. Without, without the stemming process, I would have to type in the exact match wars to actually find this. Okay. And that that kind of stemming is handled by the Porter stammer. There's, that's a very popular stammer. Uh, the search engine is further tuned by my own stammer here, like this one. So shield, I can type in shield to find shield. So just demonstrate that. Okay, so here we have here, this one. Because the this shield is, is S dot, you know, H period, I period, you know. Without this stammer, you would have, the user would have to actually type in this to find that particular movie, uh, the stammer reduced this term to this. So, so it made it searchable by typing a simple shield. And I want to point out that th I made some, I increased the number of stammers, okay, in the 100K version. So I mean, excuse me, in the full data version. So this is the 100K version is the first version. Let me bring up the second version. The full, in the full data directory, there's another version. So this is the second version. It's got a little bit more explanation and stuff. This is the full data version. So over here it says full data. Let me show the stemmers. I added more stemmers here. Okay, so you notice how the list is longer. So for example, II becomes two. Well, I added that because I was trying to look for Star Trek 2. Right, and, and the Star Trek 2 is actually Star Trek II. Like, like this with the II. But my point is that in the old version, in the 100K data version, that would not be possible because II is not being reduced to 2. So the Star Trek 2 search actually won't work, but it will in the new one. So tuning search engine is a very manual process that you just have to improve it over time. And the comments show what I'm trying to test. So in the main function, there's, so I want Star Trek 2 to match Star Trek II. I want Star War to match Star Wars with the S. Uh, this tests the the multiple the the, the multiple uh, match, prioritize Dragon Ball movies, as opposed to Dragon movies or just Ball movies. And needs to match AD. That's another stammer that I did. So that's basically. Uh, what this is all about. The, the actual output, let me, so let me run this, show that, show you the actual output. The output's in temp, because I, I know it will crash for me.
So the output prints like statistics about uh, what the search engine encounter. So, for example, like a lot of times you want to remove very common words, and I didn't just automatically remove them. I print out the most common words and ask myself, okay, do I want to keep this word or do I want to remove it? So that's one example of manual tuning. And some bigrams, these are common combination of words. So, so how much weight do I put into the bigrams as opposed to certain words? Like, like Dragon Ball, that's why one of the searches for Dragon Ball. So how much better is Dragon Ball to all to get together this phrase Dragon Ball as opposed to a single dragon or a single ball? Okay. And this is where I got the ideas for stemming. It's not so go back to stemming again. It's not that I simply like how do I know how to do this, for example? Right, I, it's it's not just oh I, I just know that I just want to do that. No, no, that's not what happens. What happened is that I I don't simply know how to do this. Okay, what happens is I I looked through this and I'm like okay, like I'm not going to be able to find this. Okay, let me reduce it to a simpler form that people can find. Okay, so I look through this this alphabetical, all these non-alphabetical stuff like fear.com. Okay, people might find that. Okay, this is okay. Yeah, people might type that in. I can see that, but you know, I saw, for example, I saw shield. I saw this shield in, in this list, and I'm like, people are not gonna type that in. So let me make it simpler. So let me turn shield into shield, so people will actually type in shield. They're not gonna type this in. So you can type in this and then locate this. So basically, this output gives. It's meant to give uh, the programmer ideas on how to improve the search engine to to make things more uh, easier to locate. And here's an example. So right now I'm not using I'm using a very basic algorithm. So there's a lot of ties in the search engine. Like all these are ties. They have the same score. And I'm I'm just ordering them based on whatever order they appear in the dictionary. I guess. So there are a huge number of ties. That's how. That's also why a lot of movies it's quite difficult to allocate right now. So it's so. So for example, Avenger. So if you want to locate Avenger movies, there's a lot of Avenger movies. It's not sure about popularity, because this is by far the most popular one, right? Avengers, the best match, but you know, the algorithm is kind of simplistic, so it doesn't. It doesn't put this at the very top, so. So there's a lot of improvement uh, possible here. Search search is a difficult topic. So, but it's a it's a very basic search engine, and and that's basically me going over it. So I want to talk about using the median versus using the average. Uh, this is a very old topic in statistics, of course, median versus average. Using the average is the standard. Uh, this least squares theory requires the use of average to actually achieve least squares. But in this uh, project, I use the median. So they're all the median, they're all medians, okay? So let me use this one for example. Okay, prediction equals median plus the stuff. This median, this median is median for the movie. And then tag ls. Hey, same thing. You know, rating equals median plus all the stuff. Median is median for the movie. And ls is the same thing. Prediction equals median plus all this other stuff. And median is Medium for the movie, so there's a there's a pattern here, Lewis. Okay, th the average is the standard, and I'm using median, so I I'm not doing the standard thing, so I need to talk about it. That's why the slide is here. Whenever you're not doing the standard thing, you should talk about it a little bit more. I think I think median is makes more sense here because it's categorical data, and median makes the 
result more responsive to the model. So I have a basic example showing here. Suppose I have movie one and movie two and they're rated like this. Okay. So movie one rated three, three, four with an average of 3.3, .3, median is three. Movie two has a rating of two, three, four. The median is three, but the average is three point a three. If you use the average, okay. So go back here. If you use the average prediction, go average, okay. If you use that as a bias term, make my slide. If I use average as the bias term, movie one will have an advantage over movie two because it has higher average. Now, if I use the median, movie one, movie two, they start off at the same level. And whichever one gets a higher score, whichever one gets higher ranking, it's going to be up to these other values. And also you should bias, but that doesn't matter. Because you should bias the same for all the movies. Okay, so it's going to be up to these other values. So that's what I meant. It's more responsive to the model that when I use the median, uh, in order for one movie to have, uh, you know, to have higher median, it needs to be significantly better. Like a lot of people rate it higher, then it's going to have a, you know, has a more positive bias. So, so that's why I use the median. It's to make, uh, to make the user to give more emphasis to the user parameters, to, to give more emphasis to the parameters that are specific to the user.